So let's give a warm Windsor welcome to Brianna Dunlap. <laughs> Thank you so much, Christine. I am really thrilled to be here tonight with uh, everyone here. I do know many of your faces. So let's get started. Excellent with the, with the lights. So the book that we're talking about tonight is the Connecticut Valley Tobacco. And uh, I like this. This is fun. You know, great power and great responsibility. But I'm actually also going to put this up here. Please don't mind as I fiddle with this. Uh, okay, can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Great. Um, I do want to say before jumping into this that if anyone wants to uh, raise your hand or ask a question or contribute, that's perfectly <coughs> welcome. So the book, uh, whoop. hold on, we have a slide missing. That's fine. So the book itself is a history press publication. They reached out to me about uh, a year ago, and they asked if there was anyone looking to write a, a history within a certain timeline of the valley, and I said, yes, me. Um, so it's been about a year since then, uh, since the, the fateful day and the phone call, and this book not only is um, a project of love that uh, I wanted to put together the entire span of the history, um, I was also lucky to be able to produce this book as a capstone project for my master's degree. So it was a, a blessing for myself and also a way to give back to the valley that I fell in love with around here. I'm not a native of the valley. I'm from more of the Danbury region. So um, this book is not just a history. It's also a driving tour. At the end of every single chapter, I encourage people to visit locations around the valley, spots that you can get in your car uh, with your family and visit the history in person. Um, so there's nine chapters and nine locations and so you can explore beyond the book and see the culture in person. The book starts with the earliest tobacco and some of you may not know this, but tobacco is actually native to only the North and South American continents, Central America as well. And so the earliest tobacco, going back millennia, uh, came from South America. It was brought through native migration through Central and Mexico, up through the Great Plains, and eventually over to the east, where the tobacco that was originally encountered by uh, colonists were in early explorers was called the Nicotiana Broadleaf, and that was in the 1500s. Nicotiana uh, sounds a little familiar. Nicotine is the word that we are a little more familiar with. Uh, the plant itself was given a scientific name after the explorer, Jean Nicot, and he was uh, the one who brought seeds and samples of the plant to his sovereign mistress, and they were gifted the name of him after that. Um, the Native Americans who use this plant um, are by no means a homogenous group. Uh, tribes are varied, uh, and they had different uses for the plant, whether it was sacred uh, to please the gods or ceremonial and political, something that was uh, taken in uh, during important meetings. And those are notes that we know from traveling missionaries and explorers who would take notes on the behaviors of the Native Americans whose uh, paths they crossed. Now, the tobacco that was grown in North America was a bit bitter, and that is a, a word we can sort of say was, a, was given after a while. So as explorers were traversing up and down Central America and South America and North America, they were trying different varieties of tobacco. And they found that because of the, the trade routes, that South American tobacco was sweeter, it had a better taste. And so fairly early on, 1500s, late 1500s, 1600s, sailors and explorers are bringing different samples of seeds around and beginning to 
on purpose or by accident, crossbreed tobacco to develop a newer uh, type of tobacco that was uh, better for the taste of the colonizers. <clears throat> so how can we not talk about Windsor? We're sitting in the Windsor Historical Society. So much of the, <clears throat> the roots of cigar tobacco do you start here, but by no means is cigar uh, tobacco the beginning of that history. So um, many of us here know that 1633, that was when the first trading post was set up. And by 1640, there are documents showing that we were shipping tobacco out. It was being grown for profit. And that's a big change from how Native Americans in the region would have been growing it for personal use only. Um, so at the very beginning, there's also regulations on tobacco. Uh, I love talking about the regulations because they are a bit confusing. And uh, today we might call them a, perhaps a little silly. There's legislation in 1640 saying that residents of the region could not, the colony of Connecticut, could not take in tobacco that was not grown in this colony. Tobacco was also looked down upon. So it's a bit confusing saying, why can't they import tobacco? Is it because lawmakers did not want anyone to have tobacco at all? <coughs> or were they saying, well, if people are going to smoke it anyway, maybe we can have our people grow it more and start to produce an industry. Uh, either way, it's a little unclear. That legislation was appealed. And then in its place, there was alternate legislation regulations uh, I call it the equivalent of doctor's notes. Only uh, young men of a certain health could smoke tobacco. They had to have approval. And if you were going to choose to smoke tobacco, you were looked slightly down upon, and you had to do it by the edges of woods and away from public buildings. Um, <laughs> we see that early on there is you know, mixed sentiment about tobacco. And even before that, the first English language um, disapproval of tobacco was 1602 in England, actually. And smoking tobacco was compared to being a chimney sweep. It seems like a really odd, soft insult today. What does a chimney sweep have to do with it? Uh, the insult went further in saying that the people who took tobacco were the equivalent of people who had soot on their brains and had accepted the devil into their hearts. <laughs> So, but either way, it was clear uh, because of legislation, with the legislation, that if people were going to smoke it, you might as well try to regulate it from an early start. Uh, and we do have families here who have been growing tobacco uh, nearly consistently. The Thrall family, many of you, if you are a Muslim resident, of course, I know of the Thrall family and their residency here in the town and other uh, area towns. Uh, they were actually given a land grant from the king to grow their tobacco. Uh, so I have up here chew. Very Yankee thing to do, a little rhyme, I like it. So chew was one way of taking tobacco. And I say taking tobacco because the early records in the region didn't call it smoking. It was either taking or jerking tobacco. Well, chew was something that was uniquely Yankee. And I'm, I'm moving forward a little as a, as a digress here, but toward the Revolutionary War, uh, taking Chew was seen as so American, and British uh, people looked down upon it. They said, eh, Chew is so American. And because of that uh, type of attitude, American for the recent people who were taking on this new American personality actually took pride in doing chew and sort of rubbed it in the faces of the British people. Like, yes, I am doing chew and I am American. That's, and that's that. Um, and then the book, uh, in the early sections, I did want to do some research into two stories that um, really stood out to me from my time when I first started the Tobacco Museum because they didn't quite add up. I kept seeing little uh, bits about Sally Prout and General Israel Putnam, and both of them respectively were given credit for either inventing cigars or being the first person to bring cigars to uh, New England. So I said, oh, let's get to the bottom of this. Uh, General Israel Putnam 
was British, and then he went on to be a Revolutionary War uh, hero. He had a big personality. A lot of stories are attributed to him. Um, I will tell you a, a story to relate back to why a story of him bringing cigars back from Cuba on uh, the back of a donkey seem a little more uh, credible. There's a story where he was uh, sitting on a barrel and he dared a British soldier to also sit on a barrel with him. And they're filled with powder, explosive, explosive powder. And I said, well, I'm going to dare you to sit on this barrel as long as I'm sitting on this barrel. And they light fuses. The British soldier breaks out into a sweat. And eventually, he jumps off the barrel. And General Israel Putnam is laughing. And he says, it's onions. You know, you're, you're a chicken. So big stories are attributed to this man. And so when the story of him bringing cigars after his conquest in Cuba is put on his name, it makes sense. Uh, I did a lot of research into this, and I found that there were really no records from either him and his diaries or his peers or contemporaries that he did, um, that he brought any cigars or seeds. And by the way, the story is varied. So I'm going to say that while there's a lot of stories associated with General Israel Putnam, uh, in the book I will say that I do not believe that he was the first person to bring the cigars. It was just a, a, a neat story that perhaps developed over time. And uh, the second story, a little later, uh, around either 1801 or 1803, is Sally Prout. There's a small record on her, but Sally Prout, she's a farmer's wife, and she was a clever Yankee, and she avoided tin taxes, which is why uh, how chew tobacco was uh, transported and sold in was in tins. And so to avoid tin taxes, she invented cigars, and she had the long nines and uh, other brands attributed to her name. And that was pretty much it. And I sought out uh, local historical societies with uh, stories to track down the truth of that. I found two stories. One was, uh, well, one record was that there was a young woman named Sally Prout. And looking at her baptismal records, I found that she would have been about 10 or 13, depending on the records. Um, and she would have been far too young for it to be the right Sally Prout. There was also Sally Prout from not the time, uh, you know, 1801 or 1803. But there was a wife of a gentleman who actually worked for a chew company. And he was from Virginia. They came up here for work. And that is pretty much the end of that. So. Putting the pieces together, I would believe that that Sally Prout, um, she wasn't necessarily a farmer's wife, but perhaps she was a business person in her own sense. And when she found that you know there are issues with tin, I will turn to cigars, which I don't think she invented. She just took opportunity to start cottage industry uh, before manufacturing was a major player in the area. In short, a lot of legends. They're both good stories. Uh, so cigar manufacturing was, was big around here. After Sally Prout in the, in the 1801 or 1803 time that she did uh, make cigars, 1810 is when the first cigar factory <coughs> goes up in Suffield. And they have a bunch of uh, factories, um, Hartford, New Haven, uh, Northampton. They pop up as soon as people can make them because cigars do gain a ton of popularity after the Civil War. And uh, Warehouse Point in particular is something fun to talk about. Uh, Warehouse Point, uh, the name, has been around for quite a while. Um, actually, the founder of Springfield, Massachusetts, he put warehouses up there uh, you know, for profit and have a, a shipping center. You know, Large ships have to take off their cargo and put it onto smaller schooners to get up the river. So um, it's a natural place to also ship tobacco from. And in the 1830s, there was an accidental discovery uh, and a change in the way tobacco was, how do we say this, um, treated. I came across a story that in the 1830s, uh, there was a ship heading for Germany of our tobacco. 
but there were not any FDA regulations at the time, and ships would often not sail out of a port until they were built. So the tobacco was sitting in the hull of the ship in the summer was hot. It started to sweat, and by the time it eventually reached Germany, the tobacco had changed consistency, and it became darker and sweet, something we might call today um, a Maduro cigar. Uh, it was an accident, but it started a, a popularity of dark, sweet cigar leaves. And I like the happy little accident that came out of Warehouse Point, or so is attributed to. Uh, there were, um, beyond the valley, lots of uh, cigar manufacturing hubs in uh, New Hampshire, and also um, New Orleans, eventually later Miami, the place that we're more familiar with. Uh, and today there are still plenty of uh, manufacturers, or I should say businesses that manufacture elsewhere, but are based in the Connecticut area. So I will fast forward a little bit again as, uh, as we're going through this. So in the 1880s, we started to have some issues here. I say we as in uh, the United States government and farmers. Dutch Sumatra was growing really great cigar tobacco. It was used for filler and also binders. <coughs> and we as a nation were importing a ton of this cigar tobacco and our government and farmers said, how can we stop this? You know, that's not good. We know that we have good land for growing cigar tobacco, so let's beat out this competition. In the 1890s, there were experiments done in Florida uh, to develop an entirely new plant. So um, in a way, I think of Connecticut shade, the resulting tobacco, to be sort of a revenge plant or a, a competitive plant. They bred different varieties, these scientists. Uh, Marcus Floyd was at the lead, and uh, broadleaf, Cuban tobacco, what was being grown in Sumatra, and our, on our bog leaf. Um, and they developed a plant that's about nine or 10 feet tall, and they wanted to bring it to Connecticut. And they said, Connecticut's great, we have perfect soil up here, and how else can we make this better? So to recreate a disgusting, hot, humid, tropical climate that the tobacco was really um, quite fond of, they put up a tent. And so the first tent was put up on River Street, the turn of the century. And the tent was made out of uh, cloth, cheesecloth, actually. And to this day, we have tents put up over Connecticut shade tobacco. The distance between the poles that everyone sees, I mean, you've all seen the tobacco or worked on it, we've seen our hands raised. That distance is 33 feet. At the time when the first tents were going up, the largest moons for cheesecloth were 33 feet. And so that has carried on to today. Uh, a little fact to read. It didn't actually do very well in the beginning. So that's the honest uh, truth. The first couple of years of playing with uh, the new strain, this new breed of tobacco, it sputtered. Farmers were not really buying into it. They're saying that's a really big expense. You have to have all this extra equipment, and you have the poles, and you have the this tent thing going on, um, and it just wasn't a great strain, but after a few years, it caught on. So within the first decade, it went from being, oh, this may not work, to a booming plant in the 19 teens. So much so that child laborers were brought in uh, from Hartford, Springfield, all the cities, New York. Men and women were brought up from the South, and it was one of the first times that African Americans were being brought up from the South to work during World War I era. And um, it stayed, you know, because uh, it, it ended up being such a great economic booster to have a leaf that was light and unique and had a great taste to it. And uh, it reached a peak in the 1920s. And I'm gonna, I have a different slide that I'll get to as well. It's another type of peak. So I call this the harvest peak. Uh, we have over 30,000 acres of Connecticut being grown in 1921, and in Massachusetts, it was almost 11,000. So right around the same time, you were over 40,000 acres. It's a lot of tobacco. That's a lot. It required an immense amount of labor. And, um, it's sort of a, a joke that I write in the book. You may not laugh, because you might not see it as a joke. 
but the prohibition was also going on in the 1920s, and I say that um, people need advice. If you can't get alcohol, why not have more cigars, <laughs> more tobacco, something, anything. Um, but uh, we've never reached a peak like there was in the 1920s. Uh, moving forward once again through the 40s, uh, you know, there wasn't really anything exciting going on in the 1930s with tobacco, I will say that. Um, but during World War II, you have men, I'm generalizing, by the way, men stepping overseas to fight battles, women are stepping into factory roles. Who is going to work the fields? Because we still need labor being done. There's initiatives like the um, Women's Civilian Corps, which were uh, you know, young women could help the American war effort by being farmers. And but we also need so much more. So there were contracts drawn up between the British West Indies and our American government to bring in Jamaican workers for the first time, or again at that time they were British West Indian workers. And uh, and they worked, and they were actually transported here on uh, on warships, and the ships were um, avoiding enemy waters, and reading oral histories of the men who were brought here from Jamaica, they absolutely considered themselves part of the war effort. While they were not American, they were helping the war effort. Um, now, I'm gonna sort of you know compare and contrast here. These are black men coming from another country, and they did face uh, some discrimination. And there was also a time when, uh, in the, also in the 40s, men were coming from the South. So these were young black men who were either college age or high school age, and they had contracts as well. Their colleges worked it so that they could come up and work tobacco and make enough money in one summer to pay for a year of school. Which, by the way, as a millennial, cannot happen now. Mm -hmm. I will tell you that. <laughs> so that must have been very good money. Or school is very cheap. <laughs> um, so young men like Martin Luther King could come up. He did work for two summers. It's really incredible. He, he wrote in his diaries and, and he called his family uh, to say that he could go out to lunch and get church with white people. And that was something that he could have not done in the South. It was unthinkable. So perhaps um, coming up here to see something different and how race relations uh, could occur uh, started a seed in his young mind. Because at that time, he would have just been a scorny, scorny kid just working in the fields. Um, the people who do remember him just remember him as such. And at the same time, the men who came up from Jamaica, there's a, a story that some of them would go into a bar and the owners would break the glasses after they drank out of them. It's pretty awful, right? Can you imagine that happening to you? Um, but as a way of quietly protesting, they would show up in an entire bus, and everyone would order drinks for each other. And the bar owners realized that every single night they were smashing all their glasses. They realized it wasn't quite cost effective. And there was a bigger message to be had here. So um, I'm not saying that these workers were civil rights fighters. This was two decades before the civil rights era, but there were um, there were beginnings here in the shade fields. And uh, so this is the other peak. Mm -hmm. uh, and I misspelled that. Forgive me, Bill Harris. I know. <laughs> you see that? You see that? So the next peak was the fifties, and it's post-World War II. It's the era of, we kicked butt in World War II, yeah. Everything is better. There's new machines, there's new cars, there's shiny appliances. It's a, it's a new type of America, you know? Everyone's doing uh, a little better. And uh, it's a time of inventions. I like to talk about the inventions for tobacco. I won't harbor on them for too long because they're not for everyone, but there's inventions to uh, spear broadleaf tobacco better, which Broadleaf tobacco workers, you all speared it by hand, right? Yeah, that's it. Can you imagine a machine doing that? It'd be insane. But there were inventions to try to better that process, inventions to sew um, to shade leaves safer. They didn't work out either. But uh, it was a time to try. It was also a time of pageants. They were um, pageants from 1951, 1952, and these were explosive, fun, end-of-harvest festivals that were not just the 
big parties, but they were entire weekend uh, gatherings, and there were boat races and beautiful uh, pageants, uh, concerts, all the big stars would come. And so it was really a time to revel in the greatness that was uh, an era of all things possible. And, but there were changes to come, surely. Uh, first of all, during the 1950s, there was the invention of the homogenized wrapper. Uh, that is a type of paper, a, uh, a paste really, where you take extra tobacco that if, say you don't wanna, you can't sell it, or the government uh, bought you out or said, we'll pay you not to sell this. You can still take homogenized wrapper. Uh, or sell it to a homogenized factory where you take the tobacco and it's ground up and mixed with adhesive, uh, cellulose, so it is vegan, um, and it's turned into a paper. And then you roll cigars with that, and it's often for machine rolled cigars. That was the first hit to the industry. Um, not many farmers pulled out at that time, but there was a definite noted slowdown. And a decade later, we have the famous Surgeon General's warning. <coughs> Surely we're all a fan of that, especially doctors. Um, surprise, there is cancer and tobacco. They go hand in hand. Cigar manufacturers tried to step around a loophole. They're like, we're not cigarettes, we're a little different. So for a while, cigar companies could skate through and uh, say, we're, we're different. But eventually their sales also started to creep down. There was also the same year, at uh, the end of 1964, the repeal of public law 78. Ugh, what does that mean? Um, it means that in the American Southwest, totally different region of our nation, farmers were abusing Mexican workers and they were just horribly mistreated, but instead of actually punishing the farmers for doing that, our government kicked out all foreign labor and said, we'll just get rid of foreign labor, so you can't abuse them. And they tried to force farmers to hire all local workers. And in a, in a way, that actually backfired because there was a sh beginning of a shift in mindset and culture. People could work in air conditioning. And stoop labor was looked down upon at that time. Oh, I don't want to do it. Someone else can do it. And ultimately, that led to more, um, uh, more influx of Puerto Rican workers in the 1950s. Because Puerto Rican workers are also American. So if local kids can't work it, you could bring in Puerto Rican labor, and they will happily do it. So a lot of a lot of shifts going on in the 60s. But then there's the 70s, the housing development boom. Baby boomers are starting to buy homes. You know, that's a lot of people. It's a lot of land. And if tobacco farmers are dealing with uh, government regulations or homogenized wrappers, and the fact that you know there's cancer associated with tobacco. Uh, it's an okay time to step down. Developers would offer tobacco growers a lot of money and put in housing developments instead. And so uh, I consider that the, the, the biggest slide into uh, the loss of tobacco in the region. So the rest of the book as far as um, the 80s and 90s and, and today, um, I'll let you guys read about but how can we not talk about the process? So we did have a raise of hands for shade growers and broadleaf growers. Um, who wants to tell me how you pick broadleaf? Anyone brave enough to volunteer? Act it out. You haven't mentioned Havana too, which was big. My family grew with Havana tobacco. And then switched to broadleaf. But that was common. You do cut it? Well, not. Yeah, you cut it. Uh, Havana and broadly from, from the stock. Um, I do talk about that in the book, I promise. I do. Um, I like to, to highlight, um, I think, the, the big changes uh, in this presentation, so I apologize. Um, yes, so Havana and broadly or seed leaf is a plant that you harvest by chopping the stalk, the entire bottom of the plant, let it wilt in the field for about an hour, and then you spear it onto a lap that this person is doing here, very sharp point, or you can hook it, uh, it depends on the farmer's <coughs> preference really. And then shade grown is a little more complicated. It's a plant that farmers do not like to let ever touch the ground. So it is harvested a few leaves at a time. Workers will scoop on their butts through the rows put it into baskets, or in this case, there are tarps that are rolled between the rows. 
and you put the plants or the leaves on them and they are bags of pulled back in and then put into baskets to get sewn up in the sheds. Um, so these are modern images and it hasn't changed much. The picture on your left um, was either from the 1930s or 40s and then we have a modern picture here. Uh, they're all just sitting on their butts, and even though it's a modern picture, you have to have a, a hands-on approach to tobacco, no matter what. And, um, so the question is, what it's like to farm today? Do we have any active farmers in the audience? Yes. What's that? I was asking if there's active farmers in the audience. Yes. Feel free to, I mean, correct me or just jump in if you want to talk about what it's like. To, to farm today, um, there's a there's a lot. I like what um, Steve Drama in Enfield said. He said it's a gamble every single year, but you do it, you know, because you love it. Yes. Did you happen to go out and uh, try a few of these jobs on your own? I have not. I wouldn't say no if anyone's going to hire me for a day. I will work tobacco, but no, I'm actually not from the valley. <laughs> well, it's time to strip back or you could go to the sheds. <laughs> Call me. Call me. Absolutely. Um, so farming today, uh, or always, you have to deal with storms, mold, and a buyer's market, job securities, and, and land development, whether you're going to keep your farm or sell it. Um, these are hard things that um, I understand farmers deal with every single year. Um, and I can't tell I'm fond of tobacco, I'm fond of the landscape, and I really hope that this book will help people um, see the importance of it, of what it means for our people and our economy and the cultural landscape around here. So I encourage you guys all to talk about this, you know. Be like me, just chat to people about tobacco. Save a shed, and that's not an insane thing to say. I will tell you that um, this summer a gentleman called me uh, at the Tobacco Museum, and he said, hey, I just bought a shed, and I want to move it a mile down the road and use it for a garage. That is so exciting because he is saving a building that's part of the landscape and um, putting time and effort to do so. And I you know, suggest, you know, if you have sheds um, that you want to see saved, you can turn them into apartments or kennels or art studios, uh, that sort of thing, and, um, and support your local farmers So thank you for letting me talk to you about this history. And uh, I want you guys to all enjoy the art of Leonard Hellerman. Um, um, would you like me to do questions now or after? Um, do you folks have questions now that you'd like to ask Fiona? <coughs> OK, let's do some questions now, then we'll do the last picture. I have a question. Hello. Hello. Um, maybe someone else can answer this. I've always been puzzled by the use of the term priming. And I knew about priming, which is picking the leaves rather than cutting the stalk. And I wrote a column that's 100 years ago, it intrigued me, that in 1915, no, I think it was 1916, uh, the columnist in the Winterlocks Journal was very interested that a particular farmer in Suffield had begun to prime his Havana, picking the leaves of a, an open field uh, plant, not the shade, and you know the first priming, second priming, third priming. Where does the word priming come from, and what happened to priming broadly? And if they primed well. Do you know Ken Bone? No. Okay. He yeah, has very, yeah, very good questions. Um, can a farmer answer that for me? I really can't answer it. I raise broadly, and we don't prime. I would assume that it probably came by the number of times that they picked it and they called it the first prime, second prime, and third prime. Yes, but why prime me? It seems odd. But picking would have been a fine word. <laughs> I apologize for not knowing the technicality. <laughs> I do, I do. Um, I do know that in, like, say, the 1950s, there was also um, a difference. Um, there was, um, the, in Enfield, there was a family, um, the Schneider and Smith families, and they did not prime their broadleaf, 
and he said that it was um, messier, but priming was done when broadleaf, at least for that family, began to use, when their crop began to be bought for wrappers. They said that you'd have to prime your broadleaf if you were selling it for a binder or a filler, but perhaps it changes the plant somehow. And he also said that it was just a messier process to harvest if you hadn't primed it. So again, I'm not getting to the root of your question, but I hope that helps. Thank you. Anyone else? Sure. Yes. Me? Yes. Did you uh, go through and see the actual harvesting and how they hang it in the sheds and the different pike poles that they use? And yes. Whether it's the weight of the tobacco? Because broadleaf weighs more than Havana. And the number of plants that can be planted per acre is different. There's more Havana plants that can be planted per acre than broadleaf because of the size of the leaves. Did you get into that at all? Um, no, not all as right, far as know. what can fit on a lot, you know. <laughs> um, but yes, I have seen the process. I've been on quite a few farm tours, which is actually the first time how I met Leonard and his wife. We were in a van together. Um, yes, um, I'm sorry, so your, so your question, you want me to type? Well, I just, when you did the history, did you, is the book, does the book talk about the harvesting too? It does, it does. Um, I will say that I did not, um, you know, dedicate an entire chapter to the process. I talk about it briefly um, because um, describing the process fully is uh, tricky in, in two parts, I think. One, because farmers do not all harvest exactly the same, believe it or not. You know, there's different opinions about whether you should prime or not prime or, you know, there's different, different technicalities. And so if I write a process for how exactly to harvest broadleaf tobacco, I'm probably getting phone calls to say, that's not how I do it. Um, but there are, there's a varied methods. Um, but I do talk about um, the differences between generalizing whether you're growing sun-grown or shade-grown. Yes. Um, I grew up in Suffield and on a tobacco farm. And when we speared the tobacco, the lath was in the ground, you put the spear on top, and you put your six plants on. Now I live in Glastonbury. They spear from a horse. I don't know why, why it's so different, but every farmer I've seen. We're life. more sophisticated. Well, <laughs> this, this is why I don't buy the balance. By a horse, she means uh, a two wheel. Like that, Paul is using. Yeah. yeah. No, you can't see, see the horse. Yes, yes. he's, he's spearing on a horse. You can't see it though. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a basically half of a wooden triangle, and you can stick a spear. Well, it's on all a matter of money too, because you don't have to have handers if you spear off the ground. Mm -hmm. You don't have to hire handers. Oh. It's all money, and if you want to pick broadly, if you can do it, but you better get a better price for it because it's going to cost you more. You know, and I, to add to the conversation, I hear that buyers would, according to one farmer, buyers prefer tobacco broadly that would have been speared because it dries quicker or more evenly. While other farmers say that no, hook spearing or hook um, hooking on a lap is the best way to go. It's so many different variations of what is best. <coughs> <coughs> yeah, so there, um, so I guess I'm, I won't say I have a totally clear answer. There is a lot of a word going around. Uh, first of all, there is Connecticut shade being grown in Ecuador. That's been going on for about um, a decade. Um, for one way or another, someone did bring seeds down there and our Connecticut sheet that we are famous for was never patented. And so there's actually free reign to grow that in Ecuador. Um, last year we went on a farm tour. I won't mention uh, the farm name, but the person who gave us the tour did say that it is, um, the buyers are preferring darker 
cigar leaf right now. So if you are going to grow shade, <coughs> grow it, but someone may not buy it. So you should, or they were preferring to grow a broad leaf instead. Um, so it is a, a buyer's market, I would say. And it's sort of hard to pinpoint one reason, but those are options. Has the agricultural experimentation uh, uh, involvement diminished as the crops diminished, or are they still very active with the growers? They are incredibly active. Uh, Dr. Jim Lamandia holds a conference every single year, and it is farmers from Connecticut, and really Massachusetts as well, they attend. And he does a PowerPoint presentation, and he goes over all of the latest diseases and strains and um, the seeds that they will be planting that year. It's a very important to keep your pulse on the science of tobacco. Yes. Um, first of all, great speech. Um, uh, you mentioned um, Martin Luther King uh, working in the field. Um, I'm from Simsbury. I'm on the planning commission of Simsbury. And uh, our uh, high school students in our free, uh, Simsbury Free Library uh, uh, did research and put a little film out uh, doing research on those letters you mentioned uh, that he wrote back home to verify what had been mostly a rumor up until that time. My concern is the dormitories in which he lived in do not exist. There's only one set of buildings in, in uh, Simsbury that are falling into utter ruin that have any semblance of the dormitories that the Morehouse students um, from Morehouse College, um, such as Martin Luther King, uh, lived in during the summer. Um, we're writing the, uh, the new pl uh, uh, plan of conservation and development, and if I could, I would say conserve that. Yes. Uh, I'm learning the planning commissions actually have very little say in anything, though. Uh, and my question is, do you know of any groups that are actively trying to preserve these uh, important historical <coughs> structures. I'm, I'm terrified it's going to just disintegrate in front of our eyes. Yes, um, and I can help connect you to those organizations, and I'm sure Christine also has um, one or two in mind, but maybe we can talk afterwards about that. I'd be okay. happy to help with that effort, absolutely. <coughs> Yeah, the Connecticut Trust for Historic Preservation has done a, a study of barns, so I would go to them, um, and Brianna has other um, organizations. There's also the Simsbury Historical Society, and they're struggling a little, but they're getting a lot more active and coalescing, and I think they would be <laughs> natural <laughs> allies. <laughs> yes, yes. So sometimes uh, talks can open up questions, and that's a wonderful thing. So this is being filmed by Win TV tonight, and possibly somebody out there will have the answer to what priming actually does mean in this case. So um, uh, at this point, um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Len Hellerman. And many of you know Len because of his photographs. Um, they're an integral part of Brianna's book. Len has been a resident of Windsor for over 50 years. His actual profession was uh, dentistry, but he has been doing photography since the age of 14. And some of his, uh, some of his accomplishments, he served as president of the prestigious 100-year-old Connecticut Academy of Fine Arts. Uh, during the winter months, uh, he's often in Florida and um, serves as the events photographer for the Palm Beach Photographic Center. And Windsor residents enjoy his photographs on the cover of the Windsor seasonal calendar. There's a lot to do in Windsor. And didn't you just tell me that there were, this was your 60th cover? I could, I think it's 59 to be. 59 there cover. Were, there, were six, there were 60 covers okay. and one, one of them was not mine. All right, all right. All right. So Len is here tonight to share with you some of his favorite tobacco photographs and talk to you a little bit about why they're his favorites. And Len, do you need a microphone or? I don't think I do. <laughs> okay, let <laughs> I'll stand let, over let here in case, okay. I, in case I do. But um, gee, uh, my, my perspective here is completely different from what you've been hearing. It's, it's strictly an aesthetic type of thing. 
uh, I have found great beauty in the fields. I've been photographing, you know, since the age of 12, and I, I, I photograph many different things, and I have found that the tobacco fields are, can, can, can be revealed as being beautiful in different ways. So I'll start right in because I have quite a few pictures and we'll get moving along here. <coughs> Uh, here's a um, uh, Nicotiana tabacum. And, uh, many of you know that name, some of you don't. That's the scientific name for uh, the tobacco that we're talking about here. And um, uh, I took some of that Nicotiana tabacum flower and I brought it home and <coughs> put it in a vase and made myself a little still life photograph. Um, the way the uh, cloth hangs along in the fields is, uh, you know, just demanding that I photograph it for some reason or other. I've got uh, many thousands of photographs in the fields, many, many thousands, and uh, I, I um, can only show just a small number of them, but uh, any category of photograph that I show here tonight, um, I, I've got probably hundreds more <laughs> that are similar. <laughs> Uh, here's one of my favorite ones that when the wind takes the cloth and you know travels it up high in the sky and it, it creates quite a interesting looking composition. Here's another one in the same category with a little bit of a focal point there with the people in the picture. Uh, here's a picture that uh, where they're growing uh, broadleaf apparently uh, where, where it used to be shade tobacco. And uh, uh, I like to talk somewhat in the, in the terms of photographic art and, you know, just the, the colors, the foreground, the background, the cloud, clouds up in the sky. Um, the siding, I probably have hundreds of pictures of, of the siding of the sheds. And uh, I find, you know, that they can be very aesthetic, even in their, their uh, um, breaking down through the the weather. Here's one more. Uh, photographers uh, believe that people like to look for a, a face, or they themselves might look for a face in, in some of their aesthetic photography or, or non-representational photography, and uh, I can see a little bit of a face in that picture. Uh, these are the sheds that you all recognize on Day Hill Row, uh, the Culbro sheds, and uh, there's been quite a change there with Amazon. The last I knew that the town of Windsor was trying to decide what they could do with those sheds. Uh, if any of you have an idea about it, I think they'd be happy to hear about it, but they still exist there, but the, there's no road like that. It's a very highly paved road with the Amazon trucks running up and back. Uh, this is an infrared photograph. I take a lot of those. It's a, um, it's a type of photography that uh, makes uh, green things sort of white and uh, blue things dark. And it's got a, it's a, many photographers uh, like to use uh, infrared photography for their special effects that you get from it. Here's one more infrared photograph. And uh, here's the infrared of the same subject that I just showed the uh, Culbro Sheds. Uh, this is simply a black and white photograph that uh, was not an infrared. Photographers take their, photo their black and white photographs as color photographs and then they convert them in a computer to black and white. And so I just thought I'd mention that. Uh, this is uh, a scene that many of you have seen on Day Hill Road. Uh, it's, um, I just, it's not exactly a, a tobacco shed or tobacco field photograph, but I thought it was a cute thing to show. Uh, this is a more, a more artistic type of photograph of the tobacco sheds, and uh, photographers uh, often take advantage of, of, of sharpness in the foreground and, 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 and making their background out of focus to em emphasize the uh, one thing or the other, and uh, my wife likes that picture a lot. <laughs> I'll mention her now and then. The shadows that are, are, are obvious as we look around the fields or go into the sheds, uh, 
are so interesting. I have hundreds of photographs just of the shadows. Here I took uh, that shadow and combined it with two other photographs and made a, a collage out of it. I, I do a lot of collages of the uh, fields. And uh, here's a picture my wife does not like. <laughs> we were driving up on Kennedy Road uh, about, oh, about a month ago and um, we were going up to Route 75 and um, I noticed this particular scene and I, I whipped the card around and came back and I had to take a photograph of it. This, this resulted from the uh, low sun coming through the other end of the shed and, and lighting up that uh, tobacco cloth. You can see that the, the face of the shed is not lighted at all, it's just the, uh, the cloth. Uh, here's, um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of shadows, uh, I like to think to myself that that would be a, uh, not such a nice photograph if there wasn't a shadow up the middle of that scene there. Um, there would be a lot of so-called negative space. Here's uh, some, somehow these shadows on the sides of the sheds um, draw me to fo photograph them. I've taken many, many of photographs like that. You've all seen this type of thing driving around. Um, it's a, sort of a haunting kind of a scene in, in a way. Here's another one similar. I'm trying to decide whether I like the left part of that photograph cut off and just show the, 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 the cloth area or not, but I haven't quite decided. Uh, inside the sheds, the, um, the thralls and the browns and the hastings have been very, very, very friendly to me. They've allowed me to uh, just go almost anywhere I want in their, on their properties. And so uh, I've been able to go inside the sheds quite a bit. And I, I photographed this particular scene in, in pitch dark. I didn't include one of those in the, in the, in the, in the uh, presentation. But uh, it's, it's a little sort of scary walking around in those sheds in, in pitch dark and, and being afraid you might knock over a, a burner or something. Well, they used to dig a hole and they were charcoal in the bottom of the hole. Pardon? And they used to fire the sheds using charcoal. And they would have dug holes and charcoal was burning in a hole. Okay. That was a little scary. <laughs> this, 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 this scene here, uh, uh, I didn't know about for quite a few years. In fact, I just learned about it about three years ago. This is the, the moistening of the inside of the shed to uh, allow for the taking down of the tobacco without getting it all crushed, I guess. I, I, don't, I don't know the, the, all the details about it, but I'm just from observation mainly. And um, so these burners here create moisture and, and they moisten up the, the, the whole inside of the shed and then they're able to go up, up high and bring down the, uh, here's another scene from that uh, same thing, same type of thing. Uh, here's um, these fellows go way up high in the shed and uh, and uh, taking many many pictures like this. Uh, I found an extra head there after a while. <laughs> I didn't know it was there. <laughs> these are uh, this was taken just this past year in the uh, Hastings property, I believe, right? And it's the. Uh, 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 broadleaf tobacco or, or, or Havana, I don't know which one. And here, this was just taken a couple, about three days ago, inside the shed they were taking down the broadleaf tobacco, which was cut, you know, it, it was hung up in, in the stalks, and then they bring it down and bring it over to people who take each, each leaf off, and then they take the stalk outside the shed and someone's out there grinding up the whole shed, the whole stalk, just to get, to get rid of it. Here are some, uh, <coughs> some um, phenomena of uh, optical phenomena, phenomena, phenomena <laughs> that I uh, have photographed. It's a, this is an alpine glow. It, it, it occurs, uh, you know, maybe a half hour before sunrise or a half hour after sunset. Uh, here, the, the moon has cooperated with me to make it a nice composition right over those sheds there. Here's a, a rainbow that was taken, I believe it was this year, I'm pretty sure, right? And here's another rainbow that I took a few years back. And uh, here's another rainbow. 
and uh, puddles. Puddles uh, occupy some of the so-called negative space and help the composition of a photograph. And I'm so, so I, I run out to the fields often after a rain to, to look, for, look for puddles. Who else would do something like that? <laughs> this has been a very uh, popular photograph I took several years ago. I, I believe that's one of the sheds that burned down a number of years ago. It's, um, it's on, uh, it, it, it used, used to be on um, Kennedy Road, opposite where you go off onto Route 20, where you go off on Kennedy Road. And here's another, uh, after a rain, uh, the, the reflections of, of the uh, outline of the, of the poles and uh, remaining cloth. Uh, this has been a very, uh, um, sought after photograph uh, by some people. Uh, this one has quite a story to it. I can't go into the whole story, but a, a brewer wanted to use this photograph on his uh, bottles and, and cans. And, and so uh, my wife and I were away from home and he sent me an email and um, we went back and forth and back and forth and, and there are a lot of details to the story that I can't get into, but uh, I quit in private if you want. But anyway, it didn't didn't end up on his uh, on his beer cans or his uh, bottles. You say did or didn't? And what did end up was simply the front of a shed that you know, almost anybody could have taken a, a photograph. Just just the sh just the shed itself and, and nothing else with it. Uh, here's a panoramic photograph that's almost 180 degrees. Uh, with the help of Photoshop, you take a whole bunch of pictures and Photoshop stitches them together. Um, this is one of my wife's favorites. She's probably expecting me to mention that. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, it's one that I like, and uh, she likes it maybe a little more than I do. Is that blue stripe? I think it's a This is a scene that almost nobody sees. It's, it's way, way down. This is the Thrall property, way down the end of Thrall Road, off into the Quonset Huts. And, and, you could drive all around that place and never know that this is going on back there. It's it's quite a it's quite a scene. Here's another one of uh, how they handle the plants so carefully, one by one. Uh, here's a panoramic picture, and uh, this is way down in the back, and uh, it's, it's it's quite a scene to see all these uh, you know plants being handled and getting ready for planting. Here are the uh, workers. Uh, I've got a whole s section of work that they handle these, you know, plants so carefully, so tenderly. This picture was, uh, was I entered it in an exhibition at the Farmington Valley Art Center, uh, oh, it must be about six, eight years ago, and the um, juror was from uh, Texas Community State College, and he gave me the first prize in the whole exhibition for this photograph. After he presented me the prize at the opening ceremony, he came over and asked me, Did, that, was a, that was taken with film, wasn't it? I said, no, it was digital. And my wife swears I, that he told, said he would not have given me the prize had he known that. <laughs> uh, that's a long discussion, you know. I, I don't care what you use, film or, you know, or digital, as long as you capture the picture. This was taken a couple of days ago. This fellow, uh, I, I, Occasionally, uh, a, one of the workers will ask me what I do with the pictures, and uh, no se habla espanol. I couldn't discuss it with him too carefully, <laughs> but uh, he, I, I, I told him I'd take his picture and look for, and he thought I had taken his picture somewhere, so I took another picture of him with the idea of looking for the picture, but I, I may just make a print of this one and give it to him. And uh, focal point, uh, photographs, you know, are often nice to have some place for the eye to go, so this one has a, a quite a nice photo, focal point. Uh, uh, Stan Brown asked me to take this quite a few years ago. It's about the only real formal photograph that I've taken of the whole group of uh, workers. And uh, it, it, I, I somehow did get a few of those faces into the picture, but it's not too bad. This is a, a real proud looking uh, worker. Uh, and here's, this fellow here uh, is not a, a local worker. He's from the, from, um, the um, uh, f uh, from Florida, from uh, Little from, Havana. Uh, Little Havana. Little Havana. I couldn't think of the name. Yeah, I took it at uh, Little Havana, and uh, I just thought it was interesting to, to show. And this was. Uh, 
Uh, Brimfield, I think I captured that picture. Brimfield thought it was interesting, $5 cigars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the, the workers generally are very, very happy. They seem to be very happy in their work. This is uh, a fellow who follows uh, 50 Cent. <laughs> I had to look him up. I didn't know. <laughs> And this, this woman's been uh, working there for many, many years at, on the uh, Thrall property. Uh, and they go to these places to get a drink and, and they're often in different positions and interesting to photograph. This fellow earns his living at the tobacco industry so he has to support it with, <laughs> with smoking. Uh, and this is uh, Robert, one of the, uh, probably the main foreman now at the Thrall properties. And I just took that a couple of days ago and I asked him if I could show it and he said, he said it was okay. Well, what were those Here's tins <coughs> standing there? Could you back it up? You want me to? Yeah, what, what were those? Oh, those are the, uh, uh, they put those on top of the, the, the uh, burners mm -hmm. to create the, the moisture in the shed to, um, oh, so that they can take down the tobacco. Cement. And uh, here's a little collage of, I, don't ask me why, I just do things, you know, when I took this photograph and combined it with a picture. Here's another collage. Uh, my wife doesn't like that one too much, but I do. Uh, and the watering of the fields, here's, uh, the, the, the Browns used to use in-ground type of uh, watering, and the thralls had overhead pipes that uh, did it. I don't know all the details of the one versus the other. Uh, here's, uh, it's amazing how those plants, I, I almost never have seen one plant that was not right in a, in a, in a field like this. When they were just beginning to grow, they're just, they're just perfect, every one. It's oh, that's because you set skips. Set, over, set the skips. <laughs> if, if a plant is missing or been eaten by a worm, you, on a rainy day, you go back with a basket and you replace. Oh, for steps. that well. Oh. Very back baking, right. breaking. Job. And here's where they're, they're watering the ground just to keep it from eroding because when the spring comes, they're going to, you know, be doing something with it. So they even water the, the you know, the bare ground. This is the tornado that hit three years ago or whatever it was. And it was, it was a couple, of two or three acres, I think, that the, the thralls uh, did not replant it. And uh, this tells you something. And that's, and that's it.